everyone to the first in a series of three startup know-how panel discussions offered by IELTS Venture Development in collaboration with the UMass Amherst Technology Transfer Office. Today we'll be discussing how to create a UMass startup. For those of you who do not know me, I am Lisa Korpieski, the Director of Communications and Marketing here at the Institute for Applied Life Sciences. Next, I have just a few housekeeping items. The seminar is being recorded. If you miss any part of this panel discussion or would like to forward it to someone who could not attend, there will be a replay of this and all future seminars in this series on our website. I recommend you set your view mode to speaker. Please stay muted during the talks. We will save the Q&A until the end of all presentations. During that time, I welcome you to use the raised hand feature. Once called upon, please unmute yourself, ask your question. Also, you can put your questions into the chat and they will be read for you. Thank you to everyone who submitted your questions ahead of time. We will do our best to answer all of them. Next up, I would like to introduce you to our moderator, Ling Sheng, who is Senior Licensing Officer at the UMass Amherst Technology Transfer Office. Ling? Hi, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa, for your introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the How to Create a UMass Startup Panel Discussion. I'd like to thank the organizers of this panel discussion for organizing this event. Um, they are Karen Atta, Lisa Kopieski, Isabel Macy of IELTS Venture Development, and Bernie Jakovic uh, of the Tech Transfer Office. So um, as Lisa has mentioned that I'm um, working as a tech transfer uh, in the Tech Transfer Office and I'm serving as the um, moderator for the panel discussion today. And with the help of Lisa, who will keep track of the questions either posted in the chat box or to be asked through the raise hand function of Zoom. I thank you all for joining us today and our audience will learn from our panelists about the campus resources and support that can help guide you through the process of creating a startup company. I'd like to briefly introduce myself before introducing the panelists. And so Lisa already mentioned that I serve as a senior licensing officer at Tech Transfer Office. And at the Tech, at the tech Transfer Office, I handle invention, evaluation, protection, and marketing, as well as licensing to established or startup companies. Prior to joining the Tech Transfer Office, I worked in the biotech industry for about nine years doing drug discovery, technology development and marketing, and business development. One of the companies that I worked at was named Very Genix. Uh, which was founded by Professor David Hausman at MIT. I worked at Vergenics for five interesting and rewarding years as the company grew from a startup to a publicly traded company. Next, I'd like to introduce the panelists. After the brief introduction, each panelist will give a four to five minute presentation and we will then begin the Q&A session after all the presentations are made by the panelists. So we have a great panel of four UMass experts to provide key information and answer questions about the process of creating a UMass startup. In alphabetical order, our first panelist is Assistant Vice Chancellor Jan Donay. Uh, Lisa, is there a way for us to see Jan? So I guess um, later you will see um, Jan when she um, gives the presentation. Jen heads the Compliance and Support Services Department as well as the Office of Research Compliance. And um, at UMass Amherst and Jen and her staff provide expert guidance on managing potential conflict of interest issues concerning a wide range of activities, including startup creation by UMass Amherst employees or students. Our Second panel, panelist is Dr. Tom Ferguson, and Tom is a licensing associate working at the UMass Amherst Tech Transfer Office. And Tom is an expert in intellectual property management, protection, and commercialization, as well as in startup team development. And Tom has advised many of UMass startup team and teams, and he will serve as an instructor in the iCoreSci program at UMass in the fall. The next panelist, is Professor Barbara Osborne from the Department of Veterinarian and Animal Sciences at UMass Amherst. Barbara has been involved in the creation of IELTS at UMass and she is the co-chair of the Center for Bio uh, Delivery 
Barbara is an accomplished scientist, educator, inventor, and entrepreneur, and she has co-founded two biotech companies. Our last panelist is IELTS Venture Development Program Director Karen Atka. Karen also serves as a director for the UMass IcoSci program, and Karen is an energetic market-oriented business strategist and mentor, and she has advised and helped numerous pre-startup teams and com startup companies and small businesses. Carol also teaches innovation and entrepreneurship at UMass. So many thanks to our panelists for being here today, and let's hear their presentations. Uh, the first panelist to present is Assistant Vice Chancellor Jan Donay. Thank you, Ling. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to talk very briefly about conflicts of interest related to university startups. And I hope that I'll be able to give you some comfort that we do this quite regularly and are here to support you in all of your commercialization um, goals and objectives. Next slide, please. So there's a number of types of conflicts that require disclosure. Uh, these are the larger, largest buckets uh, of conflict. There's, there's conflict of commitment, which really is about the time that you give to an outside activity as opposed to a university activity. There's conflicts of interest, which can either be financial conflicts of interest relating specifically to a monetary uh, interest that you have outside of the university. That might be equity in a company. It might be remuneration, compensation, from uh, uh, an organization or a research conflict of interest, which really may not have a monetary um, nexus of conflict, but uh, a good example of this would be um, you develop a, a particular widget in your lab and then you use it on human subjects. That's a, an area where we would want uh, at the IRB level and at the organizational level to be sure that any conflicts have been evaluated and mitigated. And then there's the larger organizational conflict of interest. These are usually stemming from large uh, overarching institutional circumstances that intersect um, with specific transactions and might from, a, from an institutional perspective um, uh, appear to compromise the university's institutional um, objectivity. In particular, these are implicated when responding to an RFP that we might have participated in developing. That's the sort of classic example given there. Um, next slide, please, Karen. Um, the, pur the purpose of conflicts disclosure, of course, as you probably all would know, is to promote objectivity in research by establishing a set of standards um, that give the reasonable expectation to the external sponsor, to the taxpayers as stewards of the university, to the general consumers of the research outputs that we create as a university, um, that those are free of bias in the design, conduct, and reporting of the research. Um, also, to ensure that priority is given to the interests of the university in the state of Massachusetts over any competing personal interests that an individual researcher might have. Um, as well, and, and of course, underpinning everything we do to comply with federal funding requirements. So if you are, for example, a public health service funded faculty member, uh, NIH or CDC or FDA, you're going to recognize that we ask you every time you propose to update your conflict of interest disclosure, and that's because the federal government for PHS says it must be so. Next slide, please. The university has six or seven discrete policies that cover conflict of interest, but I like to just sort of give a visual presentation. If you think about what underpins our employment as public employees of the Commonwealth, you'll see at the bottom of this pyramid is the Massachusetts Ethics Law, uh, MGL 268A. That applies to all of us, though I will say that faculty and researchers broadly enjoy some um, useful exemptions to, to the requirements of this law that staff members wouldn't be able to take advantage of. And in particular, those include outside activities. So in this next level of the pyramid up, you see the university policies that implicate uh, conflict of interest management. Um, the outside activities policy, as I just mentioned, which allows faculty uh, up to one day a week during the academic year to engage in outside activities. Most of the time, I'm going to say 75 to 80% of the time, those outside activities don't implicate any conflict at all. 
but we analyze them nonetheless and where a conflict might be implicated, we can then go ahead and manage that conflict. Um, we also have conflict of interest policies related to our commercial ventures and intellectual property. And then sort of on top of that are the federal requirements I just mentioned, the public health service requirement, which is the most stringent at the federal level, but right behind that, the NSF and other federal agencies have similar either regulatory or policy requirements related to disclosure of potential conflicts of interest and management by grantee institutions. Um, and then we do see, and surprisingly, private foundations, especially in the biomedical area, private foundations will often adopt the public health service federal regulatory guidance. So we might see that in a Komen um, Foundation Award, for example. And then at the very top is our most restrictive, which is the conflict of interest relating to human subjects. So if you work directly with human subjects, you uh, recruit, qualify, or consent human subjects in your work, and you are conflicted with a related outside interest, you may be precluded from working directly with those um, human subjects. I will assure you that we always find a way to structure a project such that the work can be done. But in some cases where the conflict is, the, the magnitude of the conflict is high and human subjects are involved, most especially if we're talking about risky research, what the conflicts committee might mandate is a an arm's length investigator doing that um, recruitment qualification and consenting specifically last slide common to all the policies is this requirement of disclosure uh, those of you who've been through my training will re remember me saying I, I channel johnny cochran here and i say when in doubt let it out if you have any question about whether an outside interest of any sort might constitute a conflict of interest come and talk to me. Um, you can feel comfortable that I'm not taking notes or sharing that information with anyone until we decide whether it's an actual conflict and we walk through the process together. Um, analysis of relatedness, where there's federal funding, we're required to evaluate whether that outside interest overlaps or conflicts with uh, a federally funded research project. Once that determination is made, we then uh, present the conflict and a management strategy to the five campus conflicts committee. Um, the management is, is, is accomplished by a set of terms and conditions agreed upon in a management letter. And then to the extent that you have federal sponsors, we report. So these are the steps. And when you um, launch a startup, especially if you're a well-funded um, and, and a faculty member with a portfolio that includes you know, federal funding and potentially some of these private foundations that have interest, uh, the sooner that we begin to work together on planning for your startup and attending to the conflicts that may or may not come with it, uh, the better off you will be in the long term. And my last comment is just to say, I'm always happy to help faculty in this, in this area because it's really rewarding to see the fruits of what you all do here on campus rolled out more broadly into actual commercial products and services. And so there's a very real feeling of accomplishment that we get when we put a case together that allows a faculty member to proceed down that path and be successful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan, for your presentation. And our next presenter is Dr. Tom Ferguson. Um, hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Ling, um, for that really you know, generous introduction. Um, and before I begin, I, I just want to point out that we're at nearly 50 participants um, on this webinar, which is just totally amazing. Um, I can feel your entrepreneurial energy um, come through the monitor to me. Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, you know, as Ling, as Ling said, I'm, I'm a licensing associate at the Technology Transfer Office. Um, and like Ling, um, I also have some startup experience uh, myself before coming to the university. Um, I was a CTO of an energy storage startup. Um, I just wanted to start off, um, you know, like Jen um, talked about with her group, um, we at the TTO, the Tech Transfer Office, um, we're here to support you. We're here to help you, you know, further, um, you know, advance your technology. And in the case of startups, we're here to help you grow a company. Um, and I just want to introduce you um, to the team. Um, I'm super, super lucky um, to work with incredibly smart, experienced um, and generous colleagues. 
Um, I'll start with our interim director, um, Burnley Jaklovic. Um, in addition to her director uh, responsibilities, um, she manages inventions out of the College of Natural Sciences, um, nursing, um, chemical engineering, um, and within CNS, she, she focuses um, particularly on biological inventions. Um, our moderator, Dr. Ling Shen, um, also uh, manages inventions out of CNS, um, focusing on polymer science and engineering and food science, um, as well as inventions out of chemical engineering. Uh, myself, um, while I do a little bit of chemical engineering, I'm covered kind of the other departments, uh, mechanical, um, civil, um, electrical, and also the College of Information and Computer Science. Um, so amongst kind of the three of us, um, we encompass what I would call patentable inventions, um, although I, in computer science, I also do some software um, copyright registration work. But in that regard, I'm very much assisted by um, our operations and patent administration manager, uh, Lynn Lowe Grote, um, who in addition to um, doing copyright registration for us, um, also will work with um, faculty and students um, who do work in the creative arts. Um, and finally, um, we have uh, Marion Lakaitis. Um, she handles non-disclosure agreements, uh, material transfer agreements, federal reporting of inventions, and, and just a myriad of, of other things that help keep our, our office humming. Um, and, you know, we're here for you. Um, so this is going to be a theme of mine throughout this is please reach out to us. Um, we're always excited to talk with inventors we're, and entrepreneurs and, and, and to help in any way that we can. Um, so you can reach out to any of us individually um, or, you know, our general email address, um, as you see, tto.umass.edu works as well. Uh, next slide, please. So a bit more about what we do. Uh, so our job is to identify and protect valuable intellectual property that's generated by uh, the amazing research programs here at UMass. Um, and once we've protected, and this could be through patenting the invention, it could be through copyright registration, um, we help facilitate its commercialization um, either by licensing it to a company um, or to a UMass startup. Um, and we, I like to kind of think of ourselves, um, you know, this whole idea of commercializing a technology, it's like, it's a relay race. And unlike, you know, a typical one, which will last maybe a few minutes, this one may last five or 10 years. Um, <laughs> but it, it's our job, our office's job, essentially. Um, so the researcher will be the one who starts the race. They have this baton, which is this, you know, maybe transformative invention. Um, and they hand it off to us. Um, and it's our job to find sort of that next person um, on the relay race to hand that baton to who hopefully will be an incredibly good commercialization partner who can carry this technology forward. Um, and it could also be um, our own faculty and students who want to start a company. Um, ultimately, the goal, the end product of this, 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 this race is we, we want to be able to help create products and services um, from UMass Research that benefit the public. So very much what Jen just spoke about in her closing remarks. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just some examples of kind of the services that, that we provide for, you know, students and faculty who are thinking about starting a company based off their research. Um, my first uh, piece of advice is if you think you have an invention, you're not sure, um, please let us know. Please reach out to us. Um, there are um, practical reasons um, to let us know um, for, for public disclosure purposes. If you reveal certain aspects of your invention um, before um, we have filed for patent protection, um, that could affect the patent rights that we're able to seek. Um, and so it's, it's really important, you know, again, if you're not sure, still come to us and we'll, we'll have a conversation we'll, we'll, and we'll figure out what to do. And this kind of ties into the second point of, you know, our job is to, you know, come up with IP strategy um, in, in working with, you know, the, the attorneys who um, actually draft and prosecute the patent applications. Um, and, you know, ultimately we manage that protection process. <clears throat> Um, for the case of UMass startups um, and other commercial entities, um, we will also we also do options and licenses 
um, of UMass IP rights to your company. So what the distinction between those two things is, so let's say, you know, we have filed for patent protection, um, we have patent applications, perhaps we have issued patents, which are patents that have gone through the examination process and have been approved by the patent office. Um, we could give you an option to your technology, um, which is a very inexpensive way um, for you to kind of test the, kind of test the market, see what uh, applications, what kind of the investment appetite might be for your invention um, without having to worry about, you know, another entity gaining access to the technology. We essentially kind of hold it for you and say, okay, you have the option to negotiate for a license for this technology. So rather than going through the license negotiation, which is, you know, can be what more complicated, um, has financial responsibilities, you know, we want you to figure out, is this worth pursuing first? Um, so that's where an option could be a really good fit for a startup company. Um, and then if you do have, see that there's an opportunity for this and you need a license, um, come to us again, we will work with you to get a license um, that will, you know, allow you to succeed um, with this technology. Um, we also are very active in developing and facilitating startup programs with our UMS ecosystem partners like IELTS, iCourse, our iCourse site program, Berthume, all the various colleges on campus. Sorry if I leave anybody out, but we have an amazing network that we can connect you to. Um, and we can also connect you to the right people off campus, be it um, startup attorneys, uh, be it um, mentors, um, funding opportunities. Um, please come to us, you know, we want to do everything we can to help advance what you're doing. Thanks. Thank you, Tom, for your presentation. And we'd like to move on and to have the next presentation that will be by Barbara Osborne. Hi, Barbara. Okay, I needed to unmute. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm a faculty member in veterinary and animal sciences, um, but I guess I also am, can qualify as a serial entrepreneur, although I hadn't really thought of myself that way until just recently. Uh, in 1999, as a faculty member in vet and animal sciences, I uh, was participated in finding, founding my first company, which was Hematech LLC. This was founded, as I said, in 1999 by my then colleague, Jim Robel, myself, and my husband, Richard Goldsby. We had uh, recruited a, a fourth partner, Jim Barton, who was a lawyer and I think was absolutely critical uh, to the success of this company. The technology that we had included the first pat patent to clone mammals, which was awarded to UMass. And this was Jim Robles' invention and technology. And we used this technology to create cattle that uh, were modified to remove the bovine uh, genes encoding antibodies, uh, as well as the BSC, uh, mad cow disease gene, and ultimately we rendered them transgenic for the human heavy and light chain loci. So we made cows that had human antibodies, and that was really uh, very powerful because these cloned transgenic cattle uh, made human immunoglobulin at a very high uh, levels. And so we could immunize the cows with a human pathogen and get back antibodies that were human in nature. So this went quite well. Uh, we sold the company in 2005 to Kieran Pharmaceuticals. Uh, they sold it in 2013 to a company in South Dakota, which is actually where it's located now in uh, uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and they are currently producing uh, human antibodies to SARS-CoV-2, and whether or not they actually go into, they're in clinical trials, whether it goes into patients, I'm not sure. But we, I have no, no interaction with the company now. That was part of the agreement with the sale. So that was the first company. More recently, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, I've been involved in the formation of a company called Hasentech LLC. This company actually was founded quite some number of years ago uh, in 2004 by my collaborator, Catherine Knight at Loyola University, and again, my husband, Richard Goldsby, and myself. And we founded this company for a reason that uh, it, it, it's not relevant at all to what the company is now. But in any case, uh, more recently, we have, uh, we have 
reignited this company, I guess is the way to put it. And we uh, have formed this company around a patent for exopolysaccharide, a bacterial uh, polysaccharide made by B. subtilis that is very, very useful for treating inflammatory diseases. So this polysaccharide has been shown by Catherine's lab and by my lab to be efficacious in the treatment of a number of inflammatory diseases, including inflammatory bowel disease, a, a mouse model of multiple sclerosis, and asthma. And just recently, uh, Haasen Tech LLC was uh, awarded an NIH C STTR and to test the efficacy of EPS exopolysaccharide for the treatment of breath versus host disease. And we hope once we have finished uh, the several months of funding through the STTR phase one, that we will be in a good place to apply for a phase two STTR. So that's briefly my history um, as a biotech entrepreneur, as well as a faculty member. And I can say that if you are thinking about getting into this, make sure you start catching up on your sleep in advance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara, for your presentation. Our final presenter is Karen Aska. Karen. Hi, Karen. Are you ready? I just need to uh, unmute. I need to turn on my camera, so just a second. Okay, I think you can hear me now and see me. Uh, so, hi everyone. I do two things at UMass Amherst. I um, am the site director for the UMass i -Corps site. This is a national program that uh, prepares faculty and graduate students, mostly in the STEM disciplines, in what the National Science Foundation likes to call deep technology. Uh, to actually begin some of the very earliest steps of commercialization. One of the real points of failure for early startups is not knowing who, uh, it will, act, who will actually want to buy and use their technology or a product based on their technology. So this is called product market fit and the National Science Foundation back in 2011 started a national program which has since become a regional and local program, we can actually prepare you for a national i -Corps. So our program comes in three chunks. First, the innovators warm up, which is a 60 minute session, uh, really just a taste of what it would be like to have a conversation about the, the uh, potential market for your technology or for a technology, we give you a warm-up exercise. It's really to get your juices flowing on this. We have two programs coming up soon um, in October. Uh, you can check our website for that. Uh, we also have the Innovators Jumpstart. That's a deeper dive into working on your, uh, your technology, and your idea for a startup, testing whether uh, anyone will be interested, how you can create value, how you can solve a problem and meet an unmet need in, in the real world. We've got, uh, that's going to be a two day program this, this semester, October 24 and November 7 will be the workshops. In between, uh, you will be challenged to do 10 interviews with people you don't know and people who are not in your field. They are your potential customers or stakeholders or users. Uh, that's really where the training comes in, is that practice, seeing your technology in a different light. And then we have another program, the Innovators Rev Up, where we can support additional interviews. All of this can really help inform you on the market need, but also, even if you decide not to go any further, expand your professional skills, broaden the impact of your research, especially for National Science Foundation researchers, if you do go further, it actually creates new opportunities for funding. And uh, as I said, lets you see your uh, research in a, from a different perspective. The other program I lead is IELTS Venture Development. 
we are really, you've heard a bunch of people talk about resources. This is another uh, point of failure for many startups is uh, no one can bring uh, technology to market on their own. Uh, so, so what we are working to do is surround you with the right resources at the right time. We do this through a series of uh, different uh, offerings. The Business Innovation Fellows, uh, you can see some of them here in this, in this picture. Uh, these are 24 um, uh, fellows from the Eisenberg MBA program. We form teams around particular startups and help build the business case for the startup as you build the technology, the case for the startup. We also offer mentoring and advice. We can tap into the Mass Bio Mentor Network. We have our own network. And as Ling said in her very generous introduction, I've got lots of experience too. Uh, we have startup community web pages. We offer this to give visibility to our startups uh, so that you can actually point to a startup when to your startup page when you go out to talk to industry and uh, without having to develop your own website. We have events and office hours uh, in collaboration with the TTO. Today's panel is an example of that. And we also have a startup navigator on our website. This is the earliest version of it, our MVP, Minimum Viable Product, with lots of other resources, uh, both on campus and beyond. And so I'll close by saying, uh, echoing what, what Tom said, we want to connect you to other resources. TTO and we work together often. Tom is a member of the i um, at UMass instructors team. Ling is a customer discovery coach for uh, our i program, but we also are mindful of lots of other resources. There are entrepreneurs in residence in engineering and in uh, the College of Information and Computer Sciences, uh, which didn't quite get into this aerial view. Uh, another great resource that I really want to highlight is Paulina Borrego in the UMass Libraries. The UMass Libraries in general have excellent resources for business research, but we also have a really special research resource on campus, the Patent and Trademark Resource Center, where she can help uh, graduate students, undergraduates, members, uh, member of the public, faculty members, actually look at the patent literature in the area they're interested in uh, exploring to see where, so that you can start early on to identify where there are opportunities to create intellectual property. And that is it for the slideshow. So I'm going to stop sharing and turn it back to Ling and Lisa. Thank you so much, Karen for your presentation and many thanks to all of our panelists for their presentations. And let's begin the Q&A session. And we have a number of pre-submitted questions from our participants and thank you very much for submitting those questions. And since we have a limited amount of time for the Q&A session, so we have combined some of these questions and combined and condensed them. Um, but I do encourage you to um, Post your any follow-up questions or new other questions um, in the chat box or use the raise hand function. So the first question that I like to um, direct to our panelists and is for those who are interested in creating a startup company, what qualifications or skill set do they need to have and what are the first few steps they should take? in order to create a startup. So could any of our, um, our panelists get a start on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a flyer at that. Um, I think actually that the, the most important thing is to know that you cannot do it alone. There's a lot of evidence that uh, successful startups are team efforts. And that includes your co-founders, but it also includes being a, willing to reach out to uh, to others in the ecosystem, but also others on the panel today. So uh, I really take Jen's point that it's better to get started on conflict of interest early. It's better to get started on everything early, pretty much. Uh, and, and so that willingness to get out of your comfort zone and go and ask those questions that might 
seem like they are a pain, uh, to me, that's the first skill set that you need. Um, oh, Jen, go ahead. I have one word and I'll keep it brief, persistence. Yeah, that, that, that encompasses one of the things I was going to say. I, I, there's a, a bunch of things I can think of off the top of my head. Um, having really good listening skills um, and empathy. Um, yes, you are the expert in what you, you work on and in your particular invention, but there's a myriad of things you're going to learn and you don't, you, you, there's so much you don't know. And you can't assume that you know exactly how your technology is best commercialized. Um, that's what your customers are going to tell you, and that's what you would learn through resources like our iCore site program. So being able to empathize and listen and, and, and take in what you hear, um, being flexible, because um, your path is going to constantly change based off this new data you're getting from customers. Um, and I'll throw in one more. Um, I would say grit. Um, you're going to be working incredibly hard. I think Barbara said, you know, you know, catch up on sleep before you start your company because you're, you're not going to have much of it. And you're going to work really hard. You're going to deal with rejection. Um, but at the same time, if you get that proposal funded, if you, once, if you get that deliverable into a customer, if you start selling that first product, um, those feelings are just unparalleled. Yeah, I, I would say be able, make sure very, very early on that you can tell your mother and father or your brother and sister about your, your technology and your invention and what it means, because you're going to have to pitch it to all sorts of people. Not everyone will be in, most of them will not be in your area of expertise and you're going to need to be able to sell it to, uh, all sorts of different people. So make sure you get your five minute or two minute or 10 minute pitch down really, really solid. And as I said earlier, get lots of sleep in advance because it's, it's a real roller coaster ride. Thank you. Um, could you all also comment on who at UMass should our new entrepreneurs go to in order to start the startup creation process? Should we start with Jen, Tom, or anyone else at Tech Transport? Is Karen or? Um... Um, I, I guess I, I, I want to say there's no wrong answer. Um, I, I think we're, we're all, we all have, you know, as we kind of gave in the presentation, like unique skill sets and things that we will do to help you. Um, and so not only can we help you with kind of what we do, so like for my case, doing the IP side, um, we can also say like, hey, like, have you talked to Jen yet? Have you talked to Karen yet? And go, you should go do that. Um, I, I would just say, come to any of us and we will direct you to the right people. Anything to add from other panelists? I, I agree 100%. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah, that, if you go to any of these people, they're going to send you on to the others in the group. And, and you have an incredibly interactive, uh, really, really first rate entrepreneurial group on campus and you should make use of all of them. Yeah, and I would just say, echo Tom's saying, if you're not sure, just reach out. It's the, the important thing is to start somewhere. And, and yes, and then we will, we will connect you to everyone else. Thank you. And uh, the next question is somewhat related to what uh, our panelists have discussed. Um, so but I'd like to direct this question to uh, Barbara and Karen. Based on your experience in working with startup teams or companies, uh, could you briefly describe the biggest challenge when creating a startup and how the challenge uh, was or can be overcome? Well, I think the very biggest challenge is getting enough money to, 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 to advance your research to the point where it's really interesting and somebody wants to commercialize it. Um, it's, it's very, very uh, hard to get that first tranche of money, be it from um, another company or be it from the government. Um, I would argue 
um, in both of my experiences that the SBIR, STTR route was, was really very appealing. And that particularly if you're a startup and you don't have any employees except yourself and your other colleagues who've started the company, and STTR is a terrific place to start. But the, the, I think the biggest challenge in the beginning is getting enough money to really get your product or your technology off the ground. Thank you. Oh, Tara, please. Yeah, so I have, um, I, I agree that money is a problem, but just um, in terms of the evidence, the evidence is that there are three big problems. One is uh, what is called product market fit. Does anyone really need a product based on your technology? Can you create something that somebody is really going to find valuable enough to buy from you rather than from someone else or to forego buying at all? or using it all. The other, uh, another challenge is even if you have product market fit, can you raise the money to bring the, uh, to bring the technology to market? And finally, uh, there's a, the, the, the third big challenge is can you put together the team that really is able to do it? And all three of those things need to come together to, to be able to really be successful. That's hard. But that's why it's exciting to do and uh, very uh, rewarding, not just financially, but in terms of knowing that your technology is really having an impact or your team is really having an impact on uh, a pro an unmet need. Thank you both for sharing your perspectives. And I'd like to direct the next question to Jen. Um, the question is, are international researchers subject to any restrictions or requirements if they wish to create startups at UMass? Thanks, Ling, for the question. Um, there are no specific restrictions that apply to foreign nationals in the U.S. launching companies. And in fact, I think the data would demonstrate many of our most successful companies are started by foreign nationals. I think you always have to be attentive when you're working in certain areas of technology to export control regulations. Um, and they may, they may intersect with the question of a startup and they may um, require some analysis. But generally speaking, uh, the, the majority of the startups that we would see coming out of the UMass ecosystem are unlikely to produce export controlled technology and far more likely to be the products of fundamental research and therefore um, perfectly acceptable for foreign nationals to ca commercialize and capitalize on. And, and the only other thing I'll add is that obviously that's subject to visa requirements and the visa status for a, a foreign national, but no inherent uh, restrictions or concerns at all. So uh, Jen, thank you for uh, your comments. Could you uh, clarify with regard to the visa um, requirements. So does that mean that uh, in order to uh, work with other individuals at UMass to create a startup, um, then a foreign uh, international researcher should have to have the proper visa status in order to do that? Yeah, I'll give you an example Ling, of a circumstance we've seen. We've had faculty where they have a postdoc in their lab here on a particular type of visa, visiting scholars visa or a, um, a um, OPT, an occupational, you know, uh, opportunity, professional development visa. And they want that person to then go to work either at a startup that they've begun or at some other company for which they have a collaboration. The visa is usually linked to the employer. So there's some amending of the visa that needs to be done. Again, not a, not a preclusion or a problem, but one more sort of thing on that checklist, right, that Karen would list for you or Tom would list for you or I would list for you if you enter the ecosystem in our offices. Um, so a, a, a thing to consider, but not anything that should operate as a preclusion necessarily. Thank you, Jan. Okay, Link, we have a question in the, from the audience, and we also lost Barbara, unfortunately. So can David Sela please unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure, thanks. I think I see Barbara right there. It's gonna- I'm back now. Yes. Barbara, I'll ask you a few questions offline about this, this balance and the lack of sleep, but uh, until then, um, I'm gonna ask a question. Well, a quick question to Karen. Who's a librarian you suggested that we contact? 
that's Paulina Borrego, and I will put her name and a link to her guide in the chat. Fantastic. Um, I, I have tons of questions. I'm only going to ask one question, though, and this is maybe going towards the TTO folks. Um, right now, we have a bunch of these like little low-level contracts, either they're sponsored research agreements or they're MTAs or they're non-disclosure agreements, but there's all kinds of different language floating out there, and there might be some little like intellectual property here and there. Hopefully, there, no one's taking a chunk, but like I just got this like vague sense that I have some loose ends with these kind of things. Is there someone who is like in charge of making sure like we're not stepping and you know what when it comes to that when we want to move forward with developing our own technologies? So are, are these um, agreements that are being proposed by other entities to you? Well, these are like over the years, we have a few MTAs okay. that like, oh, they're going to review our manuscripts. I don't really care if you're going to do that too. I just... I, I just feel like there's a few yeah. things that I kind of want to take a look at. That's all. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I would say if you have any IP concerns regarding, you know, any proposed agreements or any agreements that have been executed, um, you know, certainly get in touch with us, you know, and we'll, we can, you know, take a look at the agreement and, and just make sure that everything looks okay or, you know, let you know what your obligations are. Okay. Great. So there's no, is, do you, uh, the reason why I'm asking this specifically, and a couple months ago, we had this discussion about UMass Innovation Institute and who's taking which portfolios and that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. um, the question is, and we can talk about this offline because it's very specific for me. So actually, why don't we stick a pin in that and allow other people to ask questions? Sure. Looking forward to talking more. So I do see that there's a question in uh, the chat box. Lisa, would you like to read this question or? I can read that question to Jen. That question is directed to Jen. Um, the disclosure on conflict of interest needs to be done for um, establishing a startup company. Can the disclosure be done before a startup company is registered? Yeah, that's a good question and thank you for asking it. We, we would typically, again, no matter which uh, office you started with, we would try to outline the steps in a logical form um, and a logical sequence. You know, it's ideal if we're in contact about a potential conflict before the uh, NUCO is um, incorporated. That's ideal. It makes a clean slate. But by no means do I want anybody to be concerned if they have already incorporated a NUCO that they shouldn't then come forward and ask for conflict support and analysis. I, again, I'm not going to judge. I'm just going to take the facts as they come, get you aligned with the policies, get a, get a case uh, put together and get it managed if that's needed. So um, ideally before, and oftentimes the planning process for spinning out a new co is complex enough that I do know about it before because they go to Tom or to Ling um, in TTO to start the discussion about licensing and Tom and Ling will alert me. Or they go to Karen saying I need some help with some market assessment and Karen will say we probably should think about whether ultimately at the end we're going to have a conflict. So there, there's a, an order that I will tell you feels clean and nice to me as a compliance officer. But the real world never works in that clean and nice way. So whatever the, the timing, whatever circumstances you have, I would encourage you to come forward and we'll pick it up and help you from where you start. But if you're planning it perfectly and you want to write a textbook scenario, the, the disclosure of the new co should come before the incorporation. Thank you, Jen. So a related question is, uh, let's say a family member is a co-founder of a startup and the startup would like to uh, negotiate a contract with UMass being an option agreement or license agreement. Uh, does the conflict disclosure process uh, for the professor has to be completed before UMass can enter into uh, negotiation with the startup or it does not have to be completed? Again, a really good question. And what I'll say is the conflicts policy allows for some exigent uh, determinations to be made by the Vice Chancellor for Research and Engagement. The challenge is that those exigent circumstances under policy don't typically include equity. They include, um, you know, so if you come forward and say, I'm going to consult for a Bayer, we can make that happen pretty quick, even if there's a conflict involved. We are working with our OGC to push on this particular issue because equity, honestly, is the, 
the, the number one outside interest that implicates a conflicts management plan. Um, so, you know, in the ideal world, I'll say one thing, but the actual, the way things play out, it, it, you know, I will take whatever we can get and we will get it aligned and on the right track. Thank you, Jan. Since you mentioned the word equity, I think um, there is a question actually relating to that. I'd like to direct that question to Tom. Uh, under what circumstances will UMass take equity shares in a startup? Yeah, very, very interesting question, Wing. Um, so in a license agreement, um, you know, basically what we're doing, just to back up a bit, um, you know, UMass says in this agreement, okay, we agree to give, you know, license the technology to your startup um, so that you may, which will comprise a patent portfolio, and you will then, um, you know, use diligent efforts um, to commercialize this technology, and and that's kind of what a sense the license agreement is. Now, there's various types of payments um, that are kind of involved in that, you know, because basically what we're trying to do is make sure that any entity that we're licensing it to can use commercial diligent efforts to commercialize the technology to create products and services that will ultimately benefit society and the public. Um, we don't want to be licensing to folks who we don't think can actually do something with it. Um, and one of those kind of typical payments that's in, you know, university license agreements um, is an upfront fee. Um, and what an upfront fee is, is it, it's basically kind of a showing from, you know, the, the licensee, the company, the startup, um, that, hey, like, we're serious about this. We're not just going to, like, take this patent portfolio, this technology, put it on a shelf, and just do nothing with it. Um, so here's this upfront fee to kind of show you that we're serious about this. Um, now, this it works for like a big pharmaceutical company or established companies who have that kind of money to give as an upfront fee. But for a startup where you are very cash constrained, you know, as Barbara said, like money is so, 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 so important. And you just don't have that kind of funds. And if we were to ask for those funds, it would totally hamstring your company and you wouldn't be able to get off the ground. You know, that we'd be hurting ourselves and hurting you by asking for that. So in that scenario with a startup, what we'll normally do is say, okay, you can't give us an upfront fee, totally understand. Please, let's negotiate an equity percentage or a, a small ownership percentage of the company in lieu of such a, a fee. So that's typically where um, equity kind of comes into play. Thank you, Tom. So uh, we still have about three questions. Um, from I our... have a couple in the chat. Okay, so maybe we should... Um... Wait, let's answer these first. So um, Shane asks, how does a UMass support IP protection patenting for a startup after the company has already begun operations? Um, so this all kind of depends upon um, the circumstances under which the IP was generated. And so what I mean by that is that the university um, will um, take ownership in any inventions that result from significant use of the university's resources. So for example, if you're a faculty member or a grad student um, who's being paid by the university, if you're doing, if the invention arose from work that you did in you know, UMass laboratories, um, those are just some examples of what significant use of university resources are. And for those types of inventions, um, you're obligated um, to um, assign the rights to the university, to UMass. Um, so in that case, um, you, you would be working with our office um, to, um, you know, we, we'll protect the invention, um, we'll, you know, assist with patent prosecution, like I said, um, also with the licensing of the technology um, to your startup. Um, so that's like how we support UMass inventions and that's how we would support them. Um, if the invention was not conceived um, using civic and university resources, so like let's say your startup eventually leaves campus and you know you're doing your own thing, you're not using UMass funds, you're coming up with new inventions, um, you know at that point um, it's up to you and the patent council that you retain um, to protect um, that invention. Um, so we just really deal with inventions that are generated using UMass resources. So we originally plan to have each of our panelists to give a final takeaway because of the limited time, I think we should go to the rest of the questions in the chat box. 
Um, there was one question says, are there any regulations about having foreign invest investors? Jen. Yeah, um, are, 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 are there any regulations about having foreign investors? And regulations about what? Having foreign investors. Oh, foreign investors. Um, there are. I, I am not an expert on this, but yes, there are. Um, not a ton. And I think it depends on the technology space that you work in. But um, yes, that is something that we need to have on the list and be mindful of for you all. And again, it depends on the specific circumstances. Okay. And I'll add to that, Ling, that there may be some uh, non-dilutive, some grant programs where there are rules uh, about, if not foreign investors, absolutely, what percentage foreign investors can own to be eligible, I think specifically for SBIR and STTR awards. Absolutely yes. correct in the eligibility, yes. Thank you. And the final question in the chat box is also directed to Jen, um, but all to all of you. Uh, who should I contact for filing the disclosure on conflict of interest for establishing a startup company? So that's me. And the conflicts disclosures are now done through the Kowali conflict of interest module. And it is a um, unified disclosure form. So it asks you a bunch of questions right up front. Apologies for that. But the idea is that you and I then aren't going to have to go back and forth on a bunch of email and have me ask those questions in an email string. The questions are devised. It's a smart form. So as you answer, it may ask you more or less, depending upon your answer. And they are devised to help me narrow down which policy applies to your circumstances based on your funding portfolio and the activities and interests that we're talking about. But uh, directly to the Kowali uh, portal and the form is pretty easy to walk through. So if, if anybody has uh, questions about where to find it specifically or needs help once they're in it, myself or Melinda, available to help. Okay, Ling, we're out of time. Great. Would you, uh, thank you all for participating. I think, uh, Lisa, would you give your- Sure. Uh, Absolutely. So I wanted to thank everyone for attending today's seminar and thank you to all of our panel members and a special thank you to our moderator, Ling. It's been a very lively discussion. I've learned a lot myself. Our next seminar is scheduled for Thursday, October 29th. It'll be entitled, What Founders Need to Know About Startup Law Before They Have a Startup Attorney. So save the date and we hope to see you there. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>